How's everybody doing? You want me to tell you what? Something nice and something gentle or calming or soothing or something good? No, are you sure? Something real? Okay, all right. All right, I want to talk about an ugly word. Power. Organizing is about power. Power is the ability to act. Now, I happen to love that word, because I think that word also means agency, it means capacity, it means relationality, it means the capacity to be able to make an impact. In Judaism, there's a concept called kavod, which means dignity. But dignity, in order to be real, has got to make an impact. There's a very famous Jewish theologian wrote a book called The Lonely Man of Faith. And he talks about this concept of kavod within the context of the two atoms. The one atom who makes an impact, builds civilizations, builds technology, and the other atom who's aware of the limitations that he's a creature, that she's a creature. And that, that those two atoms, those two, those two dimensions of our humanity, and it's really Adam and Eve, but it's, or it's all of us, male and female, okay? But it has to do with the fact that we are relational beings. We are beings whose, whose capacity to ex exercise agency occurs and is embedded in relationality. Now, I say that because, unfortunately, the light's in my eye, and I can't see very well when the light's in my eye. Is there a way to move it a little bit, okay? Because it's hard for me to think. We already tried. Okay, Jesus. Anyway, never mind. Okay. 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 Ah, yes, you do too. Okay. I say that because in thinking about school reform, there's a lot of smart people who've come up with a lot of good ideas about what to do in the classroom, what to do with children. There's been an enormous amount of analysis of all kinds of strategies for literacy, numeracy, I don't want to bring you or bore you with any more stories about what works. You know what works. Our problem is not we don't have the ideas. We know from studying Canada or Finland or any other country, New Zealand in the world, even Mexico, okay, with Jose Vasconcelos when he organized the, the schools after the revolution, made sure that the teachers who went to those villages understood that they had to have the support of the village leaders, that you don't build schools without power. And so part of what we have to understand, if we're going to get anywhere in this business of school reform, we need power. We have a mantra, power before program. Can you say that? Power before program. Power before program. Power besieged program. What does that mean? It means that there's all kinds of programs out there for leadership development, for reading recovery, for teaching numeracy leader, the algebra project, the youth project, all kinds of great programs out there. The problem is not that we don't have the program, we don't have any power. Now, I can care about this man, I can love him, okay? to death, okay, but the problem is that unless the two of us come together with a plan and act with some agency, we're going to be humiliated time and time again. And that's what's going on in this wonderful world of ours, okay? And if you don't believe me, you can read all the Harvard scholarship about inequality, <laughs> all the NIT scholarship about Yale scholarship about the way in which the people who've got big money, Jacob Hacker, Paul Pearson, written a book about how the big money people have organized big lobbies. You can read the Wall Street Journal yesterday if you've got half a brain and read about the guy in, in Dallas named Simmons who calls up Carl Rove and says, who can I support today who's going to elect somebody who's going to support my political interests and my economic interests? Because he's, he's not a billionaire, he's a gazillionaire, okay? And if you don't like him, you can go to Bob Perry in Houston, who does the same thing with Rick Perry and supports all of Rick Perry's inane initiatives, okay? <laughs> now, 
Rick Perry can't think about anything. Oh, all right. Okay, you're, 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 now, we're going to have boundaries for me. All right, good enough. That's, that's because I'm older. All right, that's all right. No problem. Okay. Rick Perry can't think about anything. Can't name three agencies. He's as dumb as you can get, as dumb as a post. He's governor of the state of Texas. Okay? But we don't have to go to Texas. We can go to Arizona. We can go, to, we can go anywhere in the United States and see people who can't construct an English sentence, and they're running things. We demonstrated to the world in year 2000 that adult education works because you can take a numbskull, okay, who comes out of, okay, a well-connected family and with a lot of his education, make him a reasonable facsimile for President of the United States, okay? <laughs> we almost repeated it, okay, with the game change story with the governor of, of Alaska, okay, who absolutely knew nothing, okay? But nonetheless, these people are deciding what's taught, where it's taught, and how it's taught. Why? Because we don't have the sense to get off our rear ends and organize. Now, before you applaud, before you applaud, because you don't know, I don't know whether or not you've got the discipline or, the, or the, the discipline or the capacity or the anger to really think hard about what that means. Because organizing requires patience. It requires a sense of humor. It requires the ability to kind of deal with Robert Corden we talked about, about being publicly critiqued all the time. And so if you're going to build a community of learners, a place where innovation takes place and creativity takes place, where people learn how to imagine, we're going to have to get people together, number one, who trust each other. And we're not, we don't have the patience to build a kind of relational trust in our communities. We don't have the patience to have the kind of conversations with people, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, because I know that none of you are going to be there tomorrow morning when we try to teach you how to do relational meetings, okay? When Mr. Joaquin Sanchez is up there going to try to teach you how to do a relational meeting. Because in order to do a relational meeting really, really well, you've got to learn from Malcolm Gladwell. It takes 10,000 hours. It takes 10,000 hours. You've got to do it over and over and over again and be critiqued by people whom you trust and you trust because they've demonstrated to you, yes, that they care about you. They are your friends, not your, not your buddies, but your friends, because they've been there for you time after time again. They've gone through critiques, they've gone through, they've gone through actions with you, they've gone through risk taking with you, and because you've built that kind of trust with them, you know that you can count on them when push comes to shove. They'll argue with you, they'll critique you, they'll, they'll, make, you, they'll make you furious with them but you know you can count on them. Now, how do we build those kind of trust relationships in schools, in communities, in institutions? It requires leadership. Organizing is about identifying, testing out, and developing leadership. Looking for people who've got talent, who've got imagination, who've got curiosity, but most of all, a sense of humor about themselves. Now, if you think that this this work is easy, it requires the kind of patience because you've got to deal with people who are numbskulls. You've got to deal with people who don't have the discipline to think about things, who just pop off all the time. And you've got to be able to do that with a sense of they've got something to offer. You've got to have that kind of patience to see that they've got something to offer, okay? And that's tough. That's hard. Now, my big critique of this wonderful institution and is that you send us wonderful, well-trained, smart, intelligent, educated, prepared people who to become leaders, superintendents, and principals who don't have one ounce of humor and one ounce of humility, okay? <laughs> and because of that, they cannot take a critique and they last two years. That's what happens in Baltimore, that's what happens in Austin, that's what happens in Los Angeles, and the life, the life expectancy of a school superintendent is that of a second lieutenant in Vietnam, in combat. <laughs> and most, of the time, most of the time, what was happening to those second lieutenants in combat in Vietnam? Who was shooting them? 
their own troops were shooting them. That's right. Because they were making stupid decisions based upon a lot of expertise that they'd been grounded into them at West Point and officer training school, and they had not a lick of sense about what was going on on the ground. They had no appreciation for tacit knowledge, knowledge that people have which comes out of their experience. Knowledge that you can't gain from deductive or inductive reasoning. Knowledge that only comes to you when you begin to do a lot of that hard and tough concept of listening. <laughs> listening to people not just with your ears, but with your eyes and with your nose and with your body. Can you watch what people are thinking, okay, as they're talking or not talking? And pay attention to the, to the screaming that's going on inside of them as you talk. Mm. Now, if you know when people are screaming as you talk or not talk, then you're beginning to do some real active listening with your body to hear what's not being said. Now, that requires an enormous amount of critique of yourself and the way you go about this business. And that means you've got to have people who are colleagues that you trust who can tell you that every time you do something, lay a dump, it smells bad, okay? <laughs> and you're no different than anybody else in that regard, okay? <laughs> and that your opinion is no better than anyone else. All of us have opinions. And all of them are equally worthless. <laughs> I repeat, all of us have opinions. And all of them are equally worthless. What is important in this business is not your opinion, but a judgment. And your capacity to make judgments. And judgments are are ideas that are arrived at by taking an opinion and rubbing it up against evidence and rubbing it up against an argument and developing the capacity to argue with people who are colleagues, who are collaborative with you. There's a wonderful book written by a fellow named Graf called Clueless in Academe. Is that the way you pronounce it? And he argues that the reason why so many of our young people don't do well is they don't know how to argue. And he starts the book off talking about a, 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 a skit from, any of y'all know who My, Monty Python is? Okay, there's a wonderful skit that Monty Python does called the Argument Clinic, where a guy goes in and he says, I want to pay for an argument. And they say to him, go down to room 12, 12. And he goes into room 12, and he immediately starts getting insulted, okay? And after being insulted for about two, five or six minutes, he says, wait a minute, I didn't come here to get insulted, because the guy starts calling him all kinds of names. And he says, I came in here for an argument. Oh, that's room 12A, okay? And so then he goes into room 12A, and immediately there's contradictions. The guy goes back and forth, and he starts to contradict him. He says, wait a minute, I didn't come here for contradictions to be told off. I came here for an argument. Oh, you're in the wrong room. Okay, that's in room 12B, okay? So basically, the point of the, of the book is that we don't know what an argument is. We think arguing with somebody is insulting them or contradicting them with them or disagreeing with them. No, an argument is about developing a hypothesis based upon observations. Young people have an innate ability to develop hypothesis all the time. They are observing all the time. So we have to draw on that innate ability, that innate curiosity, that innate imagination, and then hone it and develop it and inculcate in them the ability to make distinctions about good arguments and bad arguments. And we use all kinds of school of, of tests of evidence, okay? And so they learn how to construct an argument and test out an argument and then learn how to make concessions in an argument, okay? When they learn how to argue, they learn how to do well, no matter what their test scores say. In fact, there's no relationship between test scores and the ability to argue well and effectively, which is why so many of our schools are failing our children, because they've adopted this horrible model, which was developed by the Billionaire Boys Club, okay? 
This horrible model which is developed out of the market model in economics, which assumes all kinds of atomistic assumptions, which I don't have the time to tell you where they come from or why they're wrong, except if you want to read a book which argues that fairly effectively, read a book by another Harvard professor named Stephen Marjolin called The Dismal Science. Okay, he's an economics professor here at Harvard, and he makes the case pretty well how a lot of that kind of thinking of the market model undermines our ability to learn, to develop. And so I'd like to leave you with a couple of ideas, and I realize I'm going to be violating the boundaries, but forgive me, okay? <laughs> Learning is about formation. Formation requires reconstructing and deconstructing ideas based upon experience and relationality, based upon experience. So we have to have the capacity to unlearn. One of my best professors always told me that his job is to be an intellectual garbage collection, collector, okay? His job was to sort out the bad ideas and bad information. All organizing, excuse me, I'm getting a little hoarse, is disorganizing and reorganizing. In order for the process of disorganizing to take place, there has to be an agent, a person, who has the capacity to agitate. Agitation is central to organizing. It means stirring your imagination and your curiosity. There's a big difference between agitation and irritation. A lot of organizers are real good at irritating people, okay? <laughs> they don't probe, they pry. And the difference between good agitation and irritation is that you get permission from the other person to agitate them, which means that they trust you, they think you have some ideas, they think you're on their side. Now, if we can ever learn how to do that well, then we can not only create really good learning institutions, we can also create really good democratic institutions because the real purpose of public education in our society is to teach the habits and practices which are requisite for the creation of a democratic culture. Ernesto Cortes didn't say that. The Supreme Court of the United States said that, that there is one institution which has the obligation to teach the habits and practices and understanding which is necessary to make democracy work. It's not the church. It's not the family. It's not the corporation. It's not the business. It's the public school. That's why we have a public school, not private school system. If we want to teach literacy and numeracy, we can have private schools. If we want to teach citizenship, we create public schools in order to make democracy work. Thank you very, very much.